Good evening. Good evening. We are in uh, Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to be discussing the third commandment today. And uh, we're doing a series here on the Ten Commandments, and as Ted Koppel tells us, they're not the Ten Suggestions. And I, I know I repeat that, but I don't think I can repeat that too much because uh, it's true. I think oftentimes we look at these things like, yeah, they sound great, but these are his commandments and we are to follow them. And as I've been making a practice of, I'm going to go through all ten, and then we'll start with the message here. And God spoke all these words saying, this is verse 1, God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Commandment 1, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to the thousands to those who love and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your servant, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. Has given you. you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And you shall not cover your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Those are the Ten Commandments. It's known as the moral law, and we, as we discussed in our summary of it, in our introduction to it, it is still in effect today, and it is that law that we look at, that we look at and we read, and it makes us realize it's that we need a Savior. It's that x-ray, as I described it that first night, it's that, as Paul describes it, it's that schoolmaster that drives us to know that we need a Savior, and that Savior obviously is Jesus Christ. And tonight, we're going to take apart the third commandment, and I'm sure it's going to drive many of you to notice that you, uh, you need a Savior, that you're, you're guilty of this, this third commandment. But uh, I think we already know that, but let's, uh, let's look at it here. You shall, not take the name of your, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That's right. First of all, remember, we've been using the word you here as God is discussing in the, text, in the context of the Israelite and all those that are in his household. But I want to strongly encourage you to put your name in there. Okay? He's talking not only to the Israelite, but he's talking to all of mankind. And he's talking to you, the believer in Jesus Christ. You shall not take the name of the Lord, of the Lord in, your God in vain. Shall not hear again is that total negation of what we're going to talk about. That doesn't mean we halfway do it. We kind of quarter, partially do it. We don't do it completely. Take the name of the Lord your God. Here again, Lord your God. He uses these phrases again. Yahweh. Yahweh, that's the unutterable name of God. If you were to go to a Hasidic Jew's household, that name would not be utterable. It is revered so much. That's the one true God. And, but then he, he, he clarifies who that one true God is. He says, the Lord, your God, and he uses the word Elohim. Elohim is the plural version. We've discussed this before. For all you Bible scholars, whenever you hear the word or see the word Elohim, there should be like a little trinity alert that goes off there. That's the God. That's God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're all involved there. That's in the same reference as, come let us make man in our own image. See that plural reference there? The word take here, take the name, 
take the name, means to raise up or to elevate. It means to exalt or apply to. And in a sense, it means to be proud and haughty. So almost in a sense here, that word capturing, that word take, is showing us kind of what the sin is itself. To take the name Lord in vain is to be proud and to be haughty about something here. And the name here, the name defines the position. So your name in your family defines your position. It's a mark or memorial of an individual. It represents the honor due. It represents the authority and the character of its object. So it's not just Joe. There's something here behind it. It, it, it re represents the report of that person and the renown of that person. I think Warren Wiersbe says it best here. He says, when you some, say someone has a bad name, you're not criticizing the name on a birth certificate. It's not like that name just doesn't sound good. You know? It's not that case. When you say somebody has a bad name, it's not the birth certificate name. You're warning me that that man can't be trusted. It's it. And if God is the greatest being in all the universe, remember he created the universe, so therefore he is the greatest being in all the universe, then his name is the greatest name. And it must be honored. And when we take it in vain, we're, 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 we're criticizing it. Basically, we're, we're, we're saying that it can't be trusted. Is that what we want to say about God's name? This word vain here, let's talk about that word vain. In Hebrew, it's pronounced shav. And it means nothingness, emptiness, uh, a vanity. And I like this definition. Anything which disappoints the hope which rests upon it. Now think about that. When you hear the Lord's name in vain, that disappoints the hope that rests upon it. At one point the Lord says, Hey, the Gentiles don't respect me because you, the Israelites, profane my name. In other words, they're not representing his name, and so therefore, all the nations around him said, hey, he must not be that, he must not be that great of a God. And here, we see it that here. It's disappointing, that action right there I just discussed, disappoints the hope which rests upon it. It often designates the object as insubstantial. It slights it. Unreal or worthless. It can also be defined as a falsehood, as a lie, or a sin, or a wickedness, a profanity, or a false swearing by. And the definition also includes taking, like I always said, is taking the object lightly or without thinking. And I'll just let me express on that just a little bit. Thoughtlessly, think of that word, to take the name thoughtlessly to the point of meaningless. And I'll include in this section here, or this definition here, the habitual or ritual meaningless repetition or use of it. So now, if we just say it over and over and over and over again, well, maybe after a while it really doesn't mean that much. For the Lord your God will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. The word guiltless here means to declare innocent. So in other words, he's not going to declare you innocent if you take his name in vain. It's... Uh, it's to be cure, clean or pure, free from punishment, free from obligation or responsibility. To absolve, acquit, pardon. I like this one too. Judicial favor. Don't we want God's favor? And yet here, it's, the verse squarely, clearly tells us that we're not going to get His judicial favor. What we're going to get is justice. It's what we deserve. We're not going to get mercy. So what's the purpose of this verse? Obviously, the not to use his name in vain, right? Obviously, that's the, and I'm sure we can all count how often or how many times we've, we've broken this commandment. The sole purpose, or the main purpose of this verse, I should say, is to tame the tongue. It's, it's basically, our tongue is a problem. I don't know about you, but my tongue is a problem. And, um, and I'm sure many of you can attest to my tongue being a problem. I'm sure you have your own little uh, short, uh, stories about my tongue being a problem. But that third commandment is a regulator of the tongue. It's a governor on it. It's going to regulate what it is. 
The flesh, all flesh is civil, but, but the tongue is, is unruly evil, full of deadly poison, as James tells us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like how Thomas Watson frames this commandment. There is no one member of the body that breaks forth more in God's dishonor than the tongue. We have this commandment, therefore, as a bridle for the tongue to bind it to its good behavior. I think that's a, a good way to phrase it. Jesus himself addresses this problem. He says in Matthew 15, verses 17 through 20, do you, do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes through the stomach and is eliminated? This is when the priests were all worried about the guys washing their hands. But those things that proceed out of the mouth, cross the tongue, come from the heart, and they, they defile man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies, which is taken the Lord's name in vain, by the way. These are the things that defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands, that does not defile a man. So Jesus clearly says that, hey, we have a problem with our tongue, and uh, God gave you a commandment to take care of it, but you haven't really followed it, dear Pharisees. And I think James puts it best. In chapter 3, he spends a lot of time on, this, uh, on the tongue here. He says, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is, per he is a perfect man, able to, able to also bridle the whole body. We'll talk about that. See, in other words, what he's saying there is that if you're able not to stumble with your tongue, if you're able not to take the Lord's name in vain, in other words here, you're able to control the rest of your fleshly desires that contaminate your body. And he's calling you perfect. Now we all know we're not perfect, so we'll, we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit more later here. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn the whole body. Look also at the ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how a great forest, see how a great forest, a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a word of a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is unruly evil and full of deadly poison. Our tongue's a problem. And I think James does a really good, gives us a really good word picture of what that problem is. And this verse, this commandment I should say, is is set forth to tame our tongue, to put a bridle in us, and to help us walk straight by con controlling our tongue. The way James kind of says it here, and then he goes on to say, can a fig tree, this is in verse 12, can a fig tree, my brother, bear olives, or a grapevine bear things? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. And I'll put that in today's language for you. What James is saying is, hey, do you kiss your mother with that mouth? <laughs> you walk down the street and you hear some things, even in nice little old half moon bed, and ask yourself, is that, are those the same lips that you kiss your baby daughter with, or you kiss your mother with? And I can say it for ladies too, for that matter. Is that mouth the one that takes the Lord's name in vain? Is that the same one that acknowledges Him? Is that the same one that praises Him, that prays to Him, that thanks the Lord, that makes requests of Him? Oh, the shame of it all, the horror of it. As Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Now, Isaiah said that about his time in the Israelites, and I can say that about my time in Half Moon Bay. I think now we kind of understand the dreadfulness of this sin. The great weight that's carried by all of us who either ignore or don't follow the third commandment for whatever reason, 
for he shall not hold us guiltless. In other words, there's punishment in this lifetime and the next. Hallowed be thy name. That's how we're to look at his name. God's name is to be revered and honored, not to be taken in vain. And the Lord God repeats himself to Moses here. See, always, when you read the Bible, by the way, this is digress for just a second. When you read the Bible, always look at where God repeats himself. Maybe he's trying to get something through to us. You know, paper was, a, was not around then. Parchments were, were very rare. So when God repeats himself, it's a big deal. And here he repeats himself in Leviticus 22, 32. You shall not profane my holy name. He was repeating himself to Moses. Moses already knew this. But I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. In other words, don't take my name in vain. Because I'm the one who separates you apart. I'm the one who separates you from everything else, from all the heathens on earth. I'm the one that makes the Israelite nation holy. You don't make it holy. I do. Jesus does something similar here. Jesus instructs his disciples not to be like the hypocrites or the heathens, but to go into our prayer closet, to shut the door, and to pray in this manner. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Again, make it, that's what he's saying there is make his name holy. That word hallowed is to make holy in Greek there. Make his name holy. You don't make it holy, by the way. He does. And we're to treat it that way. We're to treat his name that way. Peter, I think, takes it up a notch very nicely when he points out how holy, how holy his name is. He gives us that example of how holy the name is when he testifies for the chief priests in Acts chapter 4. Nor is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men which we must be saved. Amen. There's no other name. Jesus Christ. There's no other name, no other God under which we can be saved. Right. And when we take that name in vain, we diminish the hope that is within. We talked about that earlier. No other name. I can't call out to Brian. I can't call out to Think of another name. Think Steve. of another name. Joseph. Steve. I can't call out to, to Peter. I can't call out to the Pope and be saved. Definitely. I can only call out to Jesus Definitely. Christ. And when I take that name in vain, for any reason, and we'll talk about those reasons here in a little bit, for any reason, I diminish, diminish the hope to put in. And I diminish the hope not only in my own life, not in my own soul, but in others around me. If you have a family at home, you diminish the hope for that family. If you have co-workers around when that occurs, you diminish the hope they have in it, if they have any at all, in public, the same way. So you may say to yourself, well, uh, you know, I don't make a habit of doing this, so um, well, let's look at how we do it. <laughs> and and, and uh, let's see, uh, Kurt, how, do, how did this slide come out, Kurt, here? The next one? Yeah. It says, how do I curse thee? <laughs> so I had, how do I curse thee? Let me count the ways. So we can't do it technologically. I can't do it. But I had love in strikeout font. So in other words, love was crossed out and then curse followed. So how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Well, how do I curse thee? Let me count the ways. Now let me preface this discussion or this, this slide with just a, um, this isn't an all-inclusive list and there are several commentaries where you can go and find the, the list. It's very long. I tried to group some things together here. One of the things I'm going to try and do as we talk about these things is I'm going to try to say, okay, here's the obvious way. And I'm going to try to point out the contrast to the subtle way that we most often find ourselves trapped by this commandment. First of all, the most obvious way is to profane it, obviously, right? So uh, this is when we substitute God's name for a profanity, for a cuss word. And blankety blank, or blank blanket, okay? 
Uh, I get mingled. <laughs> okay. By the way, have you ever noticed that no one ever substitutes Allah's name for a cuss word? You ever notice that? I mean, maybe I haven't. I've been in the Arab world. I've been in the Muslim world, and and I I, I really wasn't hanging out with the, a lot of. Them. I did train a few of them in the Marine Corps, but I, I never heard every of them take Allah's name in vain, in, in a sense of a, to substitute it as a cuss word. Um, and uh, I've never heard anybody take Buddha's name and substitute that as cuss word, or Gandhi, or, or any of these other guys. And uh, I mean, just imagine the scenario: you're on the 18th hole. And a guy misses the three foot putt and he goes, Oh, Buddha! <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Doesn't happen. Or you're on the construction site and uh, you, you, uh, a guy takes the hammer and he hits his thumb and he goes, Allah, darn it! <laughs> Say what? It never happens, right? You've never it's seen it. Occur. And why do you think that is? Go ahead, somebody, maybe take a guess. Oh, Buddha. They don't threat. Right. There's no power in those names. When when you when somebody takes the Lord's name in vain, they it's because there's a power in that name. Amen. Jesus Christ, there's a power in that name. God, there's a power in that name. Don't ever forget that. When when you know I I have caught myself so many times. And you know They'll say, people say, well, you know, how was your weekend? Oh, we nothing, did, went to church, you know, you know. And the, the conversation will stop there. Well, you know, why didn't I say the name Jesus Christ? Is this saying I went to church? There's no power in that. But, but I went to worship Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Well, there's the power, right? It sets people back a little bit. Whoa. What's this, what's this guy into? Whoa. Okay, there's the power in that. You know, have you ever been in a sticky situation and you just kind of, you walk away? Bring the Lord's name to it. Amen. There's the power in it. My, my name doesn't give up. Hey, I, Rich says. Well, who cares what Rich says? I got no power in my name. Only in his name. It's so I, I, I think this is a healthy digression for a second here. Just his name is all the power. Ours is none of it. So, the most obvious is to profane his name, to use it as a profanity. I would also include in this category, basically, to twist his words, or to twist his name. Now, Satan does this when he tempts Jesus. He says, it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. Satan's profaning God's name. He's twisting God's words there. He's profaning it. To use his name in, in the sense, in, in defense of a sin would be another one I would throw into the profanity category. Remember, James warns us, let no one say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot tempt by evil, nor does, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed by them. You see, what we're saying is, when we say God tempted us, is my desires pulled me away, but I'm going to blame it on the Lord. Yeah. That's what we're saying. And that's what James points out here. And I would say that's a profaning of his name. Another here is to scorn him, or his word, or to say his word in jest, such as this one. Where's the promise of his coming? Everything's the same. People marry. Think of the days of Noah's Ark. People were going around like it was nobody's business. Nothing was going to happen. Noah was building his ark. It hasn't rained in years. Okay. And then it certainly did, right? Same thing. Where's the promise of his coming? So, to take his name in jest, or to twist, or to scorn him, or to twist those words somehow. Okay, to swear. We could swear. I swear by, right? This is the taking of the Lord's name when it comes to the taking oaths. This is the using the Lord's name to take oaths. Such as to swear falsely. Again, you have heard, this is Jesus speaking to the disciples. Again, you have heard it said, you have heard that it is said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, 
for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because, in other words, don't swear by your head because God made it here. Listen to this. Uh, or by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no be no. For whatever is more than these is, e is from the evil one. So to swear by his name, I swear to, I swear to, blank, blank, is to take his name in vain. Straight from the pit of hell is what, he, is what Jesus is saying here. From the evil one. And to swear by anything else. Remember he has that big thing about swear by the altar or the gold on the altar and all that. We're not to swear. We're not to swear. We're not to take an oath by that. Why do we have to raise our yes and our no to some extra level? Sooner or later, people aren't going to believe our yes and no because we have to keep raising it to another level. Actually, we're not raising it. We're lowering it. We're devaluing it. And that's what we do to the Lord when we take His name in vain in this case here. I would even extend this to taking rash oaths. You hear people take rash oaths all the time. And the best example in the Bible is, is Jephthah's vow. Jephthah goes off to battle and he returns and he says, I'm going to sacrifice to the Lord the first thing he saw when he came home. Well, what kind of vow is that, right? What does he see first? His daughter. So Jephthah sacrifices his daughter to the Lord. So not only is he guilty of the third commandment, taking the Lord's name in vain, he breaks the seventh also by killing, taking innocent life by murdering his own daughter. See how wicked men are? That's in Judges 11. That's a crazy story. Matter of fact, the whole book of Judges is just one nightly news episode after another. So, slight his name. This is another category. Slight his name. This is to speak of him lightly or slightly or his works lightly or slightly. Any, anybody under the age of 30 here? There's a couple, maybe. When's the, yeah. When's the last time you guys text OMG? Oh, gosh. Oh, oh yeah, OMG. When's the last time you, know, when's the last time you said, oh, my? Gosh. Or here's one that I, I catch myself sometimes. I'll say, you know, I'll say Jesus' name. Like, or I'll catch myself saying, she's, which is a total substitution for his name, right? So, so think about that too. Think about how we take his name lightly. We assign. We just think, don't say it just say comes and rolls off the top of our our, our tongue, so ever so casually. We're not to take his name in idle discourse. And uh, you know, think about you know when you have idle discourse with your buddies, your your girlfriends, or whatever it be. Are you taking his name, you know, just yeah, idly? It is it, you just kind of mention it under your breath or not put much emphasis on it? It's not to be idle. God isn't idle. He's to be revered. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this really nicely. He says, God's not to be discussed in the parlor over cigars. You can just imagine, you know, kind of the old scene at the men's club. Where they're reading papers and cigars and they're just talking about God like it's some sort of existentialism or something, some philosophy to be be debated. And this is a caution. I would use that this example as a caution against intellectual sin. Be careful about when you practice apologetics. Be very, very careful. And apologetics is the defense of the faith. Make sure you're defending the faith, you're defending God. Not just trying to win an argument. Not just trying to take somebody through the logical steps of philosophy that we all learned in philosophy 101. It's, oh, therefore, God. It, you want to, don't be impressed with the sound of your own voice or the sound of your own arguments. And I say that as a caution to myself more than anybody else here. God's not to be thrown about in idle discourse. To murmur. I would put murmuring in, in this slight category. You murmur against God's blessings. Oh, gosh. God, why did, why did, why'd it have to be this way? I wanted it this way. Sometimes Brian goes over the plan A, B, C thing, right? You know, and well, you know, we don't get plan A, B, or C, but we get something else. And we're like, oh, gosh, I didn't want it this way, God. Right? You know, 
What about the Israelites? How they murmur in the desert? What happened to them, right? To murmur is to question the Lord's justice. It's to say that what He's decided, what He's allowed to happen is to say, you're not happy with it. You're going to murmur against it. And when we do that, we're questioning His justice. And we're not to do that. That's taking Him in vain. I'll put another one in this category. To speak evil of God or to assign God to an act of wickedness. Absalom's guilty of this. Those of you guys who were in the study about uh, the life of David, Absalom was terribly guilty of this. Remember when Absalom commits treason against his father David, he covers it with a lie in which he says to David, I'm going to go to Hebron to fulfill my vows to the Lord. And you may say to yourself, well, I've never overthrown my father and uh, gone and made a false vow about going to somewhere to say vows about it. But have you ever made, have you ever said something falsely and then put God's name at the end of it to make it more believable? That's basically what Absalom's doing here. And I'm sure we're all guilty of that sleight of hand. And then the last category I have here is to claim but not abide. If we really claim to know the Lord, are we abiding with it? And let's look at some of the cases where this could be. We profess but do not live. Paul says to, to Titus in chapter 1, they profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, being an abominable, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Do you profess to know God on Sunday, but then on Monday you don't act like it? Ooh, we. Do you profess to know Him and then deny it through your own activities? Lord have mercy. How about when we worship with our lips but not with our heart? Mm. How about when we come here, oh, I love these praise songs. It's awesome. Awesome. But are we saying them in our heart? Ooh, we. Jesus addresses this one very well. He says, hypocrites. He's talking to the, prophet, the Pharisees again. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is so far from me. Hello. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Lord. There's a lot going on there, right? These guys are professing with their mouth, but they're not honoring with their heart. They're honoring with their lips, but not their heart. Their hearts are far from them. And here it says, and they worship me in vain and teach us doctrines, the commandments of men. In other words, they had elevated man's laws above God's laws, thus putting God's laws in a minor position, a secondary position, and putting His name in vain. Mm -hmm. Taking His name in vain. Lord have mercy. We could do that with our laws today, right? Mm -hmm. We could do that with our laws today. Look, look at abortion. Uh, just use that as an example. We'll talk about that more when we get to murder. But look at abortion. Hey, it's legal. It's legal in the, un, in the U.S. here. We, we, we fought this battle, right? It's already done with. But is it? Am I putting one law above another? To pray and not believe. But let him ask in faith without doubting. For whoever doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. This is James' caution to us about praying for something and then doubting it's going to come to be. It's going to come to pass. Now granted, God may not answer the prayer the way you want, but He does answer prayer. All of it. And we, if we doubt, we're, we're questioning His ability to come through. And when has He not come through? Show me in the Bible where God has not come through. Where His plan has failed. Where something surprised Him. It hasn't happened. He comes through and we're not to doubt it. And when we doubt it, we're taking His name in vain. And let me tell you something. You don't have to say it to take it. 
You can doubt it in your heart. You can doubt it in your mind. And you're taking his name in vain. Mm. So I think uh, clearly here we can see that we're, we're often guilty of, of breaking this commandment. And in more ways than we thought possible. I mean, I think we all thought, well, maybe it's just the first one. I discussed the profaning of it, perhaps. But obviously, there's so many more. And I told you, this list isn't inclusive. I hope tonight that you've come kind of face to face with that reality that this commandment has been broken by, by you, by me. I know I've come to it. You know, I know when I was doing this study, I just sat there coming over and over again to this realization. Oh yeah, I've done that one. Oh, 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 oh yeah, yeah. Oh, darn, I've done that one too. Here we go again. I hope that you've come face to face with that reality. Because I want to point out something to you about that reality. That reality is what the law is for. That reality is to give you that gut punch that you're a violator, you're a trespasser of the law. Mm. And that that violation, that trespass that hits you in the gut is to drive you, drive you to your knees. To repent before Him. To believe in Him. To go to Him. He's the Savior. You need the, this reality that we discussed tonight, that we so vividly saw, is to allow you to see that you can't fix it yourself. No way. That you need a Savior. That Savior is Jesus Christ. Glory. I don't think I'm telling anybody here anything new. Dig deep. But what I will tell you about it is, is this commandment is only fulfilled through belief in Him. Mm, praise the Lord, brother. It's only fulfilled through His strength, not my strength. In other words, I can't walk out of there and say, okay, I got it. Rich taught me this, and I'm going to hold on to it, and all week I'm not going to violate it. Oh, man. And next week He'll show me another one that I violated. Okay? No. It's only through His strength. Yeah. My weakness his strength. Preacher, brother. His spirit alone. I think then and only then will we realize that we can keep from taking his name in vain. Amen. Lord, I want to thank you for what your word so, so plainly and clearly and almost devastatingly shows us, Lord, that, that we are in need of you. And Lord, I want to ask your forgiveness, uh, you know, just personally, Lord, your forgiveness for my heart and for my actions and for my deeds, Lord, of taking your name in vain oh so many times, Lord. I ask that you would forgive me, Lord, and, and Lord, that you would, in your strength, help me and help everyone here, Lord, yes, Lord. keep this commandment, keep this third commandment, so that we don't, Lord, we don't take away the hope. It's found in your name. We don't diminish that hope at all. But Lord, when we speak your name, that hope is just out there bold for everyone to see. Lord, I thank you again for what this word tells us, Lord. And I pray that each and every one of us will go home, Lord, not dour and beat up by the fact that we've broken this commandment, but knowing that we can look forward to you, look forward to your strength helping us keep it from here on out. And I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.